Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. That's it. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters, my enemies drowning.
has overcome We sing We sing hallelujah We sing hallelujah The Lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah, oh, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome.
use their voices one more time and sing my heart. Morning church, Uh, standing up the front here, you can hear the power of your worship. It is phenomenal. It is incredible to be together as a community singing. Uh, I just went to Taylor Swift this last weekend and, and you can feel the excitement in people. But guys, honestly, that is nothing. It is nothing, nothing compared to what I just felt amongst being in praise and worship with you guys. Can you only imagine what it's like being in heaven? But we're seated in heavenly places. This is incredible. This is a breakthrough moment. If you've come here today with something that you are carrying, it's this place, this secret place in with community where we're standing together and we're believing for breakthrough, amen. We're coming into um, our time of communion. So you're welcome to grab your seats for just a moment and uh, get your communion ready. Amen. So for communion uh, this week, I felt to share a little bit of the journey that I've been going on lately. And I don't feel to share the part of the journey that I struggled with, but what God showed me through the struggle. It kind of felt like life or has felt like life has been hitting me from every single angle. And I've been absolutely exhausted. I don't know if you felt that, but I was truly, truly exhausted. And through that, I felt God say, Shan, remember, remember, remember in Ephesians 6, 12, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so what this means is that when we face a circumstance, we don't fight it from here but we're actually seated in heavenly places and we fight them here by faith, amen. So with that scripture, in His very, very kind way, He was reminding me to focus on Him and the power of the cross and whose I am, who I belong to. So for us today, a practical example of that is if you've got a disagreement that you're walking through with someone or you've got a work issue or a finance issue, then this is the place that we go back to the cross and we rest. We rest in what He's done and we stand in faith and we stand in prayer and declaration. And it's then that we step into God's direction for that. So then in this season when He said to me, remember Shan, what He was reminding me of is to have faith and to put my faith in action. So instead of focusing on that inner turmoil and focusing on the circumstances. And this was my biggest lesson. If the enemy can't take me out, he can wear me out. So I know that the enemy can't make me doubt in my love for Jesus, but what he can do is make me doubt God's goodness in these circumstances. And he can make me doubt and be worn out and forget to go in and connect in that intimacy of God where that place of rest is, yeah? So the reason that I'm sharing this today is because God wanted to remind us all today that one of the reasons it's written at the Last Supper when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me and taking communion is because He absolutely knew on a very, very personal level, the turmoil that we face and the circumstances that we face and how deafening it is. So this is quite literally one of the most powerful things that you can do in your walk of faith because it's a stepping into His victory over the turmoil and the circumstances, amen. So these circumstances are trying to get us to doubt the goodness of God, but guys, who who is promised is faithful, amen. So I'm going to pray. And if you're used to fighting your situations on this level, then we're gonna pray together and learn how to fight your situations from a faith level today. And I'm hoping that hearing this will help you because God wants you to know today, He is absolutely by your side and He is never, ever going to leave you.
Okay, let's pray. God, You are so good. You are our place of rest. You are our inner amongst the circumstance and the turmoil. And I thank You that we can put our trust in You. I thank You for Your body that was broken for our healing and the blood that You shed on the cross so that we can step into Your righteousness. And because of what You did on the cross, we declare healing over every single person in this room, that every single cell will come into alignment with the perfect will of God. And I thank You for the gift of loving other people. And when that's hard, I just thank You that Your Holy Spirit is ever so close to lead us and guide us and show people through Your eyes. And I thank You that You are our provider. And through You, You have called us to be the head and not the tail. And we declare breakthrough according to Your plans and purpose. And more than anything, Lord God, we thank You for the cross. We choose to remember and we thank You. Let's eat and drink together. Thank you, Jesus. You know, one of my favourite things about being in a Christ-centred church is the fact that we do do this every week, that we set aside time to remember Jesus and the enormous price that He paid to give you your freedom. And the one thing I really like is the different revelation that different people get because Linda did it in the first service and it was real and it was her perspective, the way God speaks to her and the way Shannon does it and the way God speaks to her. And God personally saved you and sacrificed Himself for you so you can have your personal relationship with Him. And that's what it's about, right? Excellent. Well, welcome Anthem Church to the 10.30 service. If you don't know me, my name is Gary. I'm a service pastor here along with Jeff. And if you're new, I'd just love you to turn your attention to the screens for a couple of minutes. We've got a media reel here that shows you all of the pathways that you can connect with the church and any relevant information that you will need to move in along with your journey. And then we'll hear from Josh. Thank you. It's so great to have you join us today. We find people have three questions when they are new to our church. How can I know God? How can I get to know some other people? How can I live my life to make a difference? If you're new to church, we want to help you know God. At the end of the service today, some of our team will be near the door to your right as you exit the auditorium. They will have a Bible for you and can help answer any big faith questions you have. If you'd like to get to know some other people, our connect groups and connect points are for you. They provide smaller settings in various locations around the coast that can help you grow, learn and belong. So be sure to ask our team or check our website for more details. There are also a few ways you can help to make a difference through our local church. You can complete our short online orientation video that will help you connect and contribute to our Anthem team of volunteers who serve in many different ways. You can give financially to support the ministry of Anthem Church as we serve our community and reach the world with the message of Jesus. You can pray with us. Prayer makes a powerful difference in people's lives. To your left as you exit, you can write your prayer needs on a blue post-it and pin it to the wall. When God answers your prayer, write it on a green post-it and share the good news with us by pinning it on top of your prayer request. You can also join us weekly on Tuesday mornings between 6am and 8am to pray for the needs of others and for the people in our community. Take any of these next steps by scanning the QR code on the card in the back of the seat in front of you or fill out the card and leave it with us at the Connection Hub in the foyer. If there's anything else you need, feel free to speak with any of our team. Awesome. How good was that, hey? It's so clear for, if you're visiting with us, hopefully you understood those steps that you can take. Uh, there are some great next steps that you can take to connect into the life of the church.
community. I just wanted to just mention something quickly. Uh, I'm not speaking today. We have with us, um, uh, who's part of our team, an amazing person by the name of Gary Blair. Uh, and he is going to be bringing the word about the word in just a moment's time. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute uh, to uh, just mention a couple of things. Uh, and that is that, you know, at our church, if you haven't noticed, we're continuing to grow. We've been in this amazing season of growth over the past, uh, uh, you know, six to 12 months. Uh, and I, I've noticed that, um, you know, there are so many new faces. If, if I haven't learned your name yet, please hang with me. I will learn your name. I've got, uh, there was a lady, Anna. Um, I think it was Anna, anyway. <laughs> Oh, no, it was Amy. Oh, no, I got her name wrong. I was practising. Anyway, so many new faces. And one of the things as the church grows is, is uh, when you look at the early church, the early church got to this point where uh, it needed more people to be engaged in the ministry. You notice that Acts chapter 6, it got to a point where the apostles said, look, um, we can wait tables and we can uh, do some of the practical things, but we, it's not good for us to do that. We need some people who, who uh, the church community gathered together and shows who could do much of the practical work uh, and help carry the load in the church. And I've noticed even today, I just I was just said to the team before, if you notice there were some lovely robe works just out the front of the church. Thank you, council. Thank you for not letting us know about that. We love you. We honour and we bless the authorities. Uh, but we'd like more information in future. Anyway, um, but I was sitting there trying to solve these issues this morning. I thought, you know what? We're at this point now as a church where we actually need more staff. Uh, I need another full-time person on staff with me. Currently, it's me and a few uh, part-time staff. And the only way we can do this, because we live within our means, is for the community to come together and say, you know what? We're willing to actually stretch a little bit in our faith. And maybe I'm a new person in the life of the church. I'm actually going to start to give to support the ministry so that more ministry can be released uh, in the life of our church so that we can continue to grow and move in all that God's called us to. Amen. And so if you're part of our church community and this is home, if you're just visiting, hey, listen, this is not the conversation for you. This is for our family, those who say, this is my home. Can I ask you to pray about, hey, I want to I make a decision, not just to give sporadically, but actually say, I'm going to get behind the ministry here. I'm going to give consistently, weekly, so that as the church grows, we have people who can help carry the load. My belief is that, that, that by the end of this year, we need to have another full-time staffer on in our church serving you. Uh, and so the only way we can do that is as we come together and commit. Can we pray for that right now? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are so generous towards us. And Lord, this doesn't come by... by uh, stress or anxiety. This comes because the church has gone to a season where we are seeing literally people saved. So we ask that provision would come in for this vision, that you would resource to be able to bless people. And Lord, I thank you that as we go forward, that there are facilities for us on the Sunshine Coast that we can own as well. We see that day coming, Lord, I know that it's out there. And Lord, we thank you that as we set our face towards the vision that you have for us, that there is going to be resource provided for buildings and for people so that we can serve people people and reach people in the community of the Sunshine Coast for Jesus. Come on. And everybody who agreed with me said a great and mighty Amen. Come on. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Seven of us. We're so excited. <laughs> no, we're all excited. Hey, it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Gary. Can we just stand to our feet and why don't we put our hands together and welcome him as he preaches today. Okay, take it easy, take it easy. It's good to see you guys. Josh, thank you for a vulnerable moment. Like, I just want you to know that it's not easy for pastors to get up and say, hey, we need money. Yeah. Right? It's not easy. And Josh doesn't take that lightly because there's like, there's this association that the guy wants to give himself a raise, he wants to get a three-piece suit, a bit of white going on, some white shoes, he wants to be featured on preachers and sneakers. <laughs> and... That's not the case. It's just so that he doesn't have to work 60 to 80 hours a week. And that's the case because I actually rent office space here and so I see Josh and then I'm like, bro, go home. He's like, no, I've just got some stuff to do. So um, thank you for being vulnerable and bringing us on the journey because we only get excited about the journey when you get to have faith for it in the beginning and then it happens and you're like, woo! But if it just happens, you're like, oh yeah. So the excitement happens because we get to partner, right? Amen. 
Drink water for dramatic, pause for dramatic effect. No, I was just thirsty. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. So this is this, this verse that I felt God give me for this sermon today. And I was just praying, I was saying, God, what do you want to say? And I was having that conversation. And then he said, go to Jeremiah. And I got nervous. Because if you've ever read Jeremiah, it's a bit tough going. But um, there's some gems in there. And even the one before and after this verse, tough. But God gave me this one, 15 verse 16. It says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. That's where we're going today. And really it's about this. How's your relationship with God's word? Like, how is your relationship with this? Because every believer is invited into partnering with God and understanding His Word and, and how you're doing in that space. And we just want to have that conversation. I don't know where you're at. I've been in various different places during the course of my life, uh, Christian life, in terms of my relationship to the Word. I remember when, like when I was young, um, I didn't really enjoy reading the Bible. Like, I've got to be honest with you. It's like reading the Bible was in the same category as eating vegetables, washing dishes, brushing my teeth, general cleanliness, you know, a teenage bloke. It's tough going. It's like it was a chore. That's how I described it. And mostly because I found it boring, and it really was boring to me. And so if you're in that space where you're like, I try to read the Bible, I just found it boring, well, I understand, I was there. Then at the end of my grade 11 year, I got saved, I got born again, and all of a sudden when I read the Bible, it was like a different book. I mean, it was the same book, but a different experience. And it turns out that having a personal relationship with Jesus is actually pretty helpful to reading this and enjoying it and getting something from it. Because if you're not spiritually alive, you can't draw on the spiritual life that's in here. But the spiritual life that's in here comes to the spiritual life that's in here, and it's just like, like Star Wars-ish, you know? It's like just resonates. <laughs> The life in me connects with the life in the Word. And all of a sudden, I loved the Word. I loved the Word. I was reading. So grade 12 is our last year of high school in South Africa. We call it matric. And I was supposed to be studying hard for my exams. And I was studying the Word hard. And like every night, my dad would come home from work and we'd have dinner. And then I'd grab my Bible and I'd go sit in his bed. And I'd say, Dad, I read this. What's going on? Jesus send some demons into some pigs because the demons asked Jesus, please don't send us. Was Jesus having mercy on the demons? It's like tricky questions. And what does he have against pigs? No, I'm joking. <laughs> so like you've got to ask all these questions. Like what about the dinosaurs and like all that stuff we're going through it. And you've got to bear in mind like before this, like a few weeks before this, I was no reader. I had never read a book in my life. We had to do it for English, you know, set works, Shakespeare and all those things. I used to watch the movie, memorize a few quotes, because you know, you've got the same quotes you can use in every essay. It doesn't matter what essay it was, same quotes. That was me. I became a brand new Christian. All of a sudden, I couldn't put this down. It's one of the most remarkable changes is that I became a reader. And I wanted to hang out with my dad, because a few weeks before, I was trying to avoid it. And now, all of a sudden, the Bible and my dad. And it came alive to me. I remember just being lost in it. And, and it, I remember the first time, I don't know if you had this experience, the first time I read the book of Acts, I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. It was just like electric. And I wish I could say that that was me for the next 25 years, but it wasn't. I got to the point at some points where this reading this became more a point of obligation like I thought I had to do it. I'm a Christian now. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've got to read the Bible. And I've got to read the Bible more. And so I didn't think I was doing that good at it. And the sense of obligation and guilt came in. And it kind of like soaked up or, or snuffed out the joy of connecting with God and His Word. And I had, a, to be honest, a season of life where I actually became disillusioned with the Word. Where I was like, God, I've been serving you and I've been studying your word and there's, there's stuff in here that I'm just not seeing. Wow. And then there's other seasons when I'm just plain distracted. You know that thing in your pocket called a phone? Like it's really handy, 
to make phone calls, send messages, do research, and lose a small portion of your life. Has anyone ever, because I tell myself, no, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to catch up on a little bit of sporting highlights. Six Nations rugby happening right now. Ireland beat Wales. Hey, Paddy, beat <laughs> Wales. My Irish mate's over there. Then I start there, and then like three hours later, I'm investigating people digging snow caves and living. Even though we have no snow in Australia, I'm still like, I need to be prepared. <laughs> and how to like set traps to catch animals and skin them. I know how to skin a rabbit in like 34 seconds flat. <laughs> Anyone else been on that hole? Okay. Literally the proverbial rabbit hole. And we live in... I know, that was a bit of a joke. You caught that? One or two people, that's smart. So, guys who are excelling over here. Um, we, we live in the most distracted generation ever. You know, I actually knew a guy who was in IT, and he said, I remember going to the, the first conference where the Java stuff was being developed, and they said, our mission is to infiltrate all of life. It's pretty sinister. And they've done it, right? And he said he, he remembers this, and that's exactly what happens. So how do we get from one of those points? And I don't know where you are today. And so I just want a little bit of self-reflection, where you're at. Maybe you're in the, hey, to be honest, I, I find this a bit boring. And maybe like me, you're like, I, I try to connect to this. I know it's the right thing. It's just boring. Or maybe you're loving it. Or maybe you're in that guilty space or that, you know, sense of obligation space or that disillusion space or just distracted. I don't know where you're at today. But how do we get from there to here? When I discovered your words. <laughs> so you see that? We've been practicing all week. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Even a broken clock is... Right twice a day. I'm joking. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. How do we get from any of those points back there? And how do we live in that space where that becomes our relationship with this? So we're going to work our way through this first. The first thing it says, when I discovered your words. The fact that God speaks to people and reveals himself in the word is central to our faith. In Exodus 31 verse 18, we've got the very first case of the words of God being written down and God does it himself. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets, inscribed them with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. It's this fact that God had this idea to take his words and inscribe them to be saved as posterity for all generations. And that thought progresses with the story of Scripture. We've got the five books of Moses. We've got the histories and accounts of God's acts with Israel. We've got the Psalms, which is some worship songs. Proverbs, God's wisdom revealed through Solomon and some others. I think Asaph, I don't know. Yeah, some guys. Prophets, it's the idea that God spoke to the prophets, his words in their mouths. And this was the Bible of Jesus and the apostles. We call it the Old Testament. They just called it the Bible. That was their Bible. And what we see very clearly in the life of Jesus and the apostles is that they fundamentally believed that those words were the words of God. That this wasn't just people who wrote about God but this was God writing about himself through people. That's what they believed. And you can see the way they interact with it, that that's what they believe. And then they added to it. They write accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, a history of the early church, the book of Acts, some letters to the early churches, and a rather unsettling book called Revelation about the end times where Jesus comes back for us and we get to rule and reign with him forever and he conquers all the darkness and dark powers of this world. It's pretty awesome. And this is what they said about it. Paul says, all scripture is God-breathed. 
or Peter, the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. That the word of God is inerrant, preserved by the providence of God, the words of God written by many and available to all. See, what we were talking about, God's cunning plan to give a word to humanity or his words to humanity, is we're talking about the democratization of faith. Democracy means that power is placed into the hands of the people and removed from the hands of a few or an elite who can use it for their own ends. So God takes faith and the truth about him and he believes and he gives it to every man, woman and child. You see, I believe that there's authority in the preaching of the Word of God, not because I'm wearing my feldskin or a checkered shirt with a collar, but because I preach the Word of God. And my authority ends at how accurately I represent this. And you're instructed to judge and evaluate. So I'm here to serve you, your faith, because your faith too is based in this word of God. You see, this belief that faith should be democratized, should be in the hands of every man, woman, and child, is really what the Reformation was all about. You know, Martin Luther and those guys, Calvin, Zwingli, they said that the, the faith has been in the hands of a few, a select elite, and that we've elevated their words above his word, and that shouldn't be the case. And so they worked at translating the Bible into the hot language of everyone in Europe. And they set up printing presses, illegal printing presses. And they printed Bibles, and they smuggled it all over Europe. Because they believed that just as Jesus said, it is written that they too should be able to say, it is written. They said it in the face of a religious elite and a political system that was in place that oppressed people and controlled them. And they paid with their life for it often, just as Jesus did with his, when he stood up in the face of a political religious elite and said, it is written. And you teach, as the, doct the doctrines of men or the teachings of men, you elevate them and place them above the doctrines of God. And it shouldn't be this way. And this is the history, the, the, the journey, the, the history of the church, the legacy that we step into. And let me tell you, a day is quickly coming where we too are going to have to find our courage and say in the face of a political elite, it is written. This is the way we live. This is the thing that defines us. This is what defines us. The people of what God have always been defined by the words of God. You see, they not only believe that it should be the final authority of faith, they also believe that everyone could understand it. And you say, wow, how did they believe everyone? Surely we need someone to interpret it? No, because Jesus said this, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Not the Holy Church. The Holy Spirit is your great teacher. And my great prayer, or my great prayer, just a little one, sorry. My prayer <laughs> is that the Holy Spirit teaches you and if the Holy Spirit is not teaching you, you forget. Because then there's no point. Right? And Jesus also said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. So the thing that qualifies people to understand this is not their education, but faith in the Holy Spirit. that he himself has taken on the responsibility to teach you. To sit with you in your room, on, when you're lying in your bed, at a table, on the toilet, I don't really care where. He wants to teach you. 
And he's saying that you can hide this. I've seen, I grew up in South Africa and I've seen university professors make this seem dead and boring. And I've seen men, Zulu men, who had three years of primary school education open this thing up and is riveting and alive. It's the great equalizer. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you know, your education, your background, God can make this alive to you in a way that you can help other people to understand it. So these reformers, they believed that this Word of God is for every generation. You see, sometimes we think we're reading an old book and we forget that this is as much, was as much written for us in this day and age as was written for the reformers or the early church. Do you understand that God had you in mind and this generation in mind when he inspired this? That it is God's word for today. The second great tr- Learning it from that verse is not just that when I discovered his words, but that when, when I discovered your words. When I discovered your words. You see, you need a personal faith in Jesus to understand this. And if your heart isn't, God, these are your words to me, that you're really going to struggle. If they're just his words, a, a distant far away God, who you hope might be interested in you, you're not going to understand, but when you say, God, these are your words to me. See, that's what Josh spoke about last week, that this points to Jesus. And when you connect it in a relationship with Jesus, they come alive to you and you find Jesus in these pages. Back to that verse. When I discovered your words, I devoured them devoured, not nibbled, <laughs> not an hors d'oeuvre. You know, like, I don't know if you take, in South Africa, we've got some of that English background where if, like there's one piece of cake there. You don't just take it. You don't devour it. You go, oh, no, I could never. Oh, no, please have the cake. Oh, I could never. Just a little bit. Split it up. <laughs> you know, very polite. God wants you to devour his word. Like my five-year-old son devours a lamb chop. He says, Dad, what are we eating tonight? What animal? He doesn't know beef and le- he just sheep, cows. That's what he wants to know about. He's African, okay? So he loves hunting, all that stuff. He devours it. God wants you to devour his word and not be polite about it, but to crave it. Look at this verse in 1 Peter 2, 2 to 3, like newborn babies. You must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Referencing the Word of God. And again and again and again in Scripture, the Bible is described as food. Right? Milk or meat in Hebrews. And milk here. And I was there, I was present for the birth of my three children. It's another story. For another day, joking. I won't tell that story. <laughs> but I was there where within minutes of my children being born, they were placed on my wife's chest and they went looking for milk. Within minutes. You see, the thing about babies is if they don't crave milk, they're either sick or they're not a baby. Craving the Word of God is one of the signs of new life in Jesus. We crave after this, and it's nourishment. Nourishment, it says. You see, the thing about nourishment is that, like, you don't eat food and then look, run to the mirror and go, am I looking nourished? Like, you just do a little bit every day consistently, and you become nourished, right? My kids, they get nourished all the time. Even now, they cry out for their milk. We come in with the bottles there in the morning. They're like excited. And they don't like just change. 
They grow so slowly. And the point is, is that right now you're living on the nourishment of six months ago. And right now, you're investing nourishment for your soul for the battle you're going to be fighting in six months' time that you've got no idea about, but the Holy Spirit is teaching you and preparing you. There are moments when God encounters us in His Word. They're called rhema moments. They're alive moments in the moment. But the baseline, the normal way, is that you're slowly nourished. And nourishment is crucial for growth. I am... Um, I, had, I worked out for one season in my life where I put on some muscle. I know it's hard to believe looking at me. But I wasn't always the bristling hulk of a man that I am now. And um, during a, a season of life, I was like working out a lot, training, all that stuff. And then it, not a lot was happening in terms of changing the way I looked. But then I found in the cupboard some protein powder. I hadn't bought it. My brother bought it because he played rugby. I was like, I'm just going to take some of this. And then over time, I was like, whoa. Right? It's that nourishment. And here's the thing. is Sometimes we're engaged in spiritual work, but we're not nourishing our soul. And if you work out all the time and you're not eating properly, you actually break down your body. And what happens in the kingdom of God is people are praying and investing and they're serving and sometimes we're carrying a spiritual weight in our families and we're interceding for people and it's all spiritual work, but you're not nourishing and you're actually breaking down yourself. It's called burnout. So the thing that allows us to keep doing the thing that we're doing is that we're nourished. And then nourishment with exercise results in great gains. Gains. You get the point. And this is why Paul says we should do it, so that we can grow into a full experience of salvation. That word salvation is saved, healed, delivered, made whole. Salvation doesn't just mean that we saved from the bad thing. It also means, or saved and pulled out of trouble, but we entered into fullness and health. Salvation is the whole thing. Anyone here want wholeness and abundance in your health? Read the Word. In your relationships? Read the Word. In your finances, read the Word. You see, there's nothing you're going to face that God hasn't given you the answer here. And just reading it, you see, I don't have to understand how it works. I just know that it does work. I just keep doing the thing in front of me, reading it on a daily basis and believing that internally my spirit man is just becoming ripped in the spirit. No wonder Jeremiah cried out, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. Let me tell you, craving the Word of God is the normal situation for any believer. If you have lost your appetite for the Word, figure out what went wrong and remove it. You know, when my kids lose their appetite, it's because they're sick. We treat the sickness, the appetite comes back. Just the way it works. And there are a few things that will absolutely kill your appetite for God's word. Number one, legalism. Obligation. Has anyone ever opened this? Because I've done this before. Open this and I start reading to connect to Jesus. And in that moment, I was going, oh, I should be doing this more. Anyone? Am I the only one? A few. Thanks, guys. I was feeling lonely for there. Because you like, there's always that insecure moment when you're like, put something out there and like everyone's like, oh, that's never happened to me. So good. <laughs> Thank you. Not because I want it to happen to you, just because anyway, you get a point. Um, obli- obligation kills intimacy. Kills intimacy. If you're obliged to do something for your spouse, you have to do this or you're in trouble with me. You don't want to do that thing. Huh? But it's when you do something because you actually want to do it that you get the brownie points. When you're in a relationship, God doesn't want you to be obligated to Him. That's why legalism is the first thing we need to repent of in our Christian life, of trying to earn God's favor. So I just want to say, if, you, if there's guilt associated with the reading of the Word of God, just stop. 
Just refuse it. Just say, guilt, you have no place in my life. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, including the sense of guilt that I'm not reading my Bible enough. Just stop that thing. It's not serving you. It's not helping you. See, the problem is, is if, if we go, if we read this, looking for our sin and how to fix it, we will find it and it will crush us. But if we read this looking for Jesus, we will find him and he will save us. Maybe you're disillusioned. And I was disillusioned because I had given myself to studying God's word and I, and I was struggling in many ways. And I've shared the story here about my struggle with depression and mental health. And so I was like, God, how come I gave myself to this? And then I feel like I got broken by legalism, which I found here. And then God had to actually counsel me. Because you know that it says the Holy Spirit will teach us. In other words, He will counsel us. So the Holy Spirit counseled me. And He reminded me that it wasn't Him that taught me legalism, that I had learned it from somewhere else. And actually it was the default wiring of the human heart. But He took me to Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, instance after instance, where He had shown me His truth and His Word. I remember driving... I was working like 14-hour days in South Africa doing maintenance work at government clinics and I spent probably four hours a day on the road and I would listen to the Bible and I was listening to Hebrews 10. And it's just like I got this sense in my spirit, like there's something here and I just push repeat, repeat. I, it was Bible on CD. That's how long ago this was. I'm younger than I look. I mean older, older than I look. Um... And Hebrews 10 just emerged and started being deposited in my soul, which says that he has perfected forever those who are being made holy through one sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus. He perfected forever those who are being made holy. And it started something in my life. And I can take you to Romans 4, where God encountered me and showed me that the promises of God, we nullify the promises of God when we try and attain them through legalism. And I can take you to Psalm 67 and Psalm 72 and Psalm 89 and Psalm 105 and Isaiah 26. Verse 3, you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you for he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for in Yah the Lord is everlasting strength. I can take you place after place after place where God counseled me by his word. Every major deliverance and healing I've gone through has been connected to this. And God had to reassure me that his word was a source of life to me. And all I'm saying to you is if you're disillusioned, ask God. Ask him to redeem this. Or maybe you're just distracted. And you've really got to figure out how to put some boundaries around that technology. One of the best things I've done recently is like, I'm not allowed to bring my phone upstairs. We've got a double story house. I don't bring it upstairs at all. And downstairs is uncomfortable and hot at night. And upstairs, air conditioning, couches, it's great. But you've got to figure out how do you build this into your daily routine? Every day. Feed on the Word. You, the funny thing about the Word of God and, and all our spiritual appetites is that only the, the appetites that work in reverse. The more we feed on it, the more we want. All human, like, appetites do with the body. Like, when you eat, then the appetite's gone. It's the opposite with God. The more you get, the more you want. And we're going to wrap this up here with his last thoughts. And when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. We bear the name of God. You know who in life, I was thinking about this, who bears someone else's name? It's not really something that we think about too much anymore. But historically, it was people that were so associated with someone that they bore their name. So if a messenger was sent by a king, they arrived and they said, I come to you in the name of King Charles. Less cool than King Jesus. But we bear his name, right? We come to people in the name of King Jesus. And the second group of people that bear someone's name are sons and daughters. That's where their surname comes from. And if you think of all the English terms, John's son, John's son, right? Johnson. 
And all these sin surnames is the son of, is that you were so associated with this person that this is where you drew your identity from. I want to give you a picture, and we're going to, this amazing picture of Jesus from Revelation chapter 19. When I saw, then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. His rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. Jesus has quite a few titles. King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Lamb of God, and the Word of God. It's his title. And he comes to us as one who said, I am so intimately connected with this that when you open its pages, you will discover me. This is who I am. So I don't know where you are today, but I want you to know that this will be life to your body, health to your bones. It will heal and restore Give energy, put a smile on your face. You know, sometimes I'm nervous to read the Bible at night because I can't sleep afterwards. I'm not that awesome. I pray that you wake up praying the words of Scripture and you go to sleep and you meditate on a day and night because we are the people of God and we follow the Word of God. This is who we are. This defines us. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for everyone in this room that we would be so marked by Your Word and a hunger for Your Word that we'd pray it, dream it, Sing it, declare it, encourage other people with it, prophesy it. We give ourselves to it, God, again and again and again. I thank you, God, that your word is alive and powerful. I thank you that it's for this generation, that when you wrote this word, Father God, you pictured a 21st century church that was going to desperately need it, that we'd be empowered by it, that we'd live it, and we would take it to our friends and family. And I pray, God, that for anyone in this room, God, if they're a believer and they're disillusioned or they, there's something that's getting in the way of their intimate connection with Your Word, I pray, Jesus, that You'd set them free. And if they're here and they, like I was, they just find it boring, and you're starting to go, maybe I need to actually be born again if that's you today. And you'd like to give your life to Jesus. And you say, I want to commit my life to Jesus and ask Him to give me new life in Him. If that's you today, can you just put your hand up quickly? I'd love to just pray with you quickly. We're not going to embarrass you. If that's you and you say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else today? Thank you. can pray this simple prayer with me just in your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross for my sins, were buried and rose again, and I place my faith in you. Forgive me and give me new life. Father God, I just pray that your words would burn in our heart and in our spirits. I pray, God, for a community that deeply, deeply, deeply loves your word. We thank you, God, for your goodness to us, the wonders of your grace that you gave us an extraordinary gift, 
that I hold within my hand your desire to connect with me. Your plan from before the foundation of the world to mark your people and let them know who you are. And all His people said, but like you mean it. And all His people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Enjoy your Sunday. You can go. And if you made a commitment today, please tell the person that you came with. Otherwise, that's what I took. Sorry, Gary. I saw your thunder there, mate. Uh, Otherwise, go see Jeff. He's at the back there. But thank you so much. Enjoy your rest of your weekend.